Welcome to Westminster Online. I'm Pastor Lori Baining, and we're so glad that you have joined us today. We believe in a God who sees you, who knows you, and who loves you still. You know, but yet sometimes we don't feel God's presence. We might feel abandoned by God or overlooked. Today, as we continue our study in the book of Ruth, we'll see a God who is very much concerned about two vulnerable, overlooked widows and who makes a way for them to find a family and long-term security. I wonder if God would care for these two seemingly insignificant women who lived over 3,000 years ago, do you think it's possible that God might care for you and for me? Let's explore that together today. Welcome to Westminster Online. We've been studying the Old Testament book of Ruth, a book that is often mm, over-romanticized and understood through North American eyes when, as we've lear learned in previous weeks, mm, their Middle Eastern culture is very different from ours. We have to read this story almost as though we are reading a foreign language being careful that we don't put our 21st century notions of male-female relationships onto this biblical narrative. In the past weeks, we've noticed that God is rarely mentioned in these chapters, and yet God is still very active. God is clearly at work through the lives of the people in this story. God is at work providing for Naomi, an extremely vulnerable widow, and God provides for her through her daughter-in-law, Ruth, a widow herself who shows a deep, stubborn kind of love for her mother-in-law. The Hebrew word for this kind of self-sacrificing, unexpected but steadfast love is Hesed, a never gives up, doesn't count the cost kind of love, the kind of love God shows to God's people throughout all of Scripture. We've seen as we've studied Ruth how God provides for these two women through Boaz, a worthy man, as our text describes him, who shares the gleanings of his fields with them. He's just a good guy. Boaz becomes the provider for these women, even though he's under no obligation to do so. Like Ruth, he too embodies God's Hesed love. But Ruth and Naomi's situation needs a long-term solution. And so, Knowing Boaz to be a person of good character and a safe person, Naomi sends Ruth to him to offer herself to him in marriage, or at least to be his servant. Naomi's thinking that if Boaz says yes to Ruth, both of these widows would be under his long-term protection and care. Not surprisingly, Humble, honorable Boaz is more than willing to step up to the plate and marry Ruth. But he knows that before he can say yes to Ruth's invitation, he must first talk to the relative that has first rights and the legal obligation to care for Ruth and Naomi. That relative is called a guardian redeemer. And that's where we pick up our story today. 
So let's turn to chapter four of the book of Ruth. And just so you know, we will be stopping quite a bit as we read these verses because we want to make sure we don't overlook the historical and cultural context in which these verses were written. Before we continue, though, let's take time to pray. Gracious God, open our ears to hear the word that you have for each of us today. Open our minds to comprehend it and open our hearts, God. Transform us. Make us more and more each day into people who act like Jesus Christ, who speak like Jesus, who think like Jesus, not just for our sake, but for the good of the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ruth 4, verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So the man went over and sat down. Okay, a few important things in this verse. First of all, the town gate. In ancient times, the city gate was the place where everything that was important happened. It was an open-air courtroom where disputes were settled, an outdoor boardroom where business negotiations took place, and a public meeting place. If you had hoped to talk to someone or see someone, you waited at the city gate, and sure enough, eventually, they would come by. You know, I was thinking, where would our town gate be today? Um, Fred Meyers? <laughs> Starbucks or something? We really don't have a central gathering place anymore, do we? But in ancient times in the Near East, that place was the town gate. Next, the word guardian redeemer. The Hebrew word ge'al is a legal term for one who has the obligation to redeem or deliver or save a relative who is in serious difficulty or danger. Other translators uh, say close relative or simply redeemer. It might be a relative who redeems or buys back a family member from slavery or who pays money to prevent them from going into slavery. It might be used to describe a relative who provides justice on behalf of a family member that would be more of an avenger redeemer. The idea of redeemer is rooted in the concept of God as the ultimate redeemer, the one who in whom all wrongs are made right. The one who saved and rescued God's people out of Egypt and slavery there. Again, a little bit of history here. God had established laws for the Israelites that commanded God's people to take care of each other. God's laws also instructed them to keep the land, the promised land that God had given them, under the care and ownership of God's people. For example, God says in Leviticus 25, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Throughout the land that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of the land. And to be more specific, the land was to stay in the father's clan and tribe. Numbers 36 commands, no inheritance in Israel is to pass from one tribe to another, for every Israelite shall keep the tribal inheritance of their ancestors. This goes back to when God had parceled out the promised land to the 12 sons of Israel. 
We'll want to keep these ideas in mind, okay, as we read our verses today. But before we move on, I want to look at one more uh, part of this verse. The sentence, come over here, my friend, and sit down. Our English translation, my friend, kind of misses the Hebrew idiom here, which literally means so-and-so or such-and-such. In other words, the author of the book of Ruth did not consider the man's name important enough to include it in the story. And this phrase is used in other scripture texts, not only Ruth, but we might wonder, it's like, hmm, was that a deliberate slight on the writer's part? Did the storyteller maybe consider this man's actions that we will soon hear about to be maybe shameful or a disgrace? Well, let's keep reading to find out. Verse 2, Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Okay, elders, another important word. Literally, the Hebrew word means to have a beard. The elders of the town were those who had earned the confidence and respect of the people. They were the community leaders, essentially the mayor, city council, lawyers, judges, and police all in one. These men had a lot of authority. For example, if, it did, if a dispute came up between two people or two groups, the elders would sit and listen to the opposing parties present their cases. They would hear the witnesses that testified on both sides. They weighed the evidence and then passed down a decision, a decision which was as binding as a court of law today. In these verses, though, the elders are simply present as witnesses to a legal transaction, the sale of land. So let's continue. Then Boaz said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring this matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. So the relative says, I will redeem it. Hmm. Now, it's a bit of a puzzle that Naomi says that, or excuse me, that Boaz says that Naomi is selling her dead husband's land. Typically, that right did not go to the wife whose husband had died. According to num the book of Numbers, if a man died and had no sons, then the land could pass down from a deceased father to his daughters. But from what we understand, that legal right did not transfer to a wife whose husband had died. Perhaps she's selling it on behalf of her sons, we're not sure. So this aspect of the story is a bit confusing to us, but still always remember from Leviticus the importance of keeping the land in the family name, in the tribe of the family's clan. Also, something else that's a bit of a puzzle. This unnamed relative has done nothing to support Naomi and Ruth up to the, this point. It's a puzzle because Bethlehem was not a large city. Certainly he would have known Naomi was back in town and that she and Ruth were now widowed and, and that he was their closest relative, their guardian redeemer. And yet he has done nothing to redeem them from their predicament. So, Honorable Boaz is the one who brings this matter to the man's attention. It's another kind of a delightful Hebrew idiom here when he says to inform you, liter um, actually literally means to uncover your ear. Remember, Boaz is not obligated to get involved in Ruth and Naomi's situation. Mr. So-and-so is the one legally responsible to deliver them. And yet Boaz does 
get involved. He shows that stubborn, doesn't make sense, doesn't count the cost kind of love for these vulnerable women. He is a worthy man, a protector in the truest sense of the word and one who follows the letter of the law. He invites the gay all, the redeemer, to fulfill his legal responsibility by buying, could be translated acquiring, purchasing, or getting, but by acquiring this land from Naomi. And at first the relative appears very ready and eager to do so. But let's continue. Then Boaz said, on the day that you buy or acquire or get the land from Naomi, you also acquire or buy or get Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Again, remember, it was extremely important in ancient Israel that the land stay in the family, in the tribe, who was originally given the land by God. God set up the guardian redeemer process to make sure this custom was maintained. God set up the guardian redeemer process to keep the family line, the name from dying out. God set up the guardian redeemer process to protect widows and the poor. This unnamed relative is required by law to redeem the land and marry Ruth. Yet, according to the law, the first son that Ruth would bear from their marriage would legally be considered the son of Malon, her dead husband, the grandson of Elimelech. In other words, Mr. So-and-so would be obligated to raise a child who would end up inheriting the land that he had just acquired. It wouldn't be his land for the long run. So the idea of being responsible for another family purchasing property that would one day be lost to him causes this man to backpedal. He doesn't want to ruin his estate um, for his other children. Could be too that he doesn't want to marry a foreigner, especially a Moabite, but he doesn't say that to Boaz. He forfeits his right to the property. He refuses to honor his legal obligation as the closest relative and says to Boaz, okay then, you, you redeem my right of redemption for yourself. I cannot do so. And then we get this little parenthetical note by the writer of Ruth in verse 7. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. The story of Ruth, which we are told took place during the time of the judges, was shared and passed down initially through oral tradition. Eventually, it was written down in the form of the book that we now have. But by the time the book of Ruth was written, the transfer of land or property was confirmed in writing, a sealed deed of purchase. But in Ruth's time, when the story actually took place, to legalize a sale of land, one man gave his sandal to another. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds a little odd to us, but it might have come from the ancient practice of taking possession of property by walking the land, putting your feet on the soil, on the ground that you have purchased to claim ownership of it. Saying, you know, in doing so, it's like you're saying, this land is mine. So let's continue. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. 
and he removed his sandal. So friends, this today, this moment would be like, kind of like um, when after all the haggling with the salesman on the price and when the salesman has left you for a few times and says, let me go talk to my manager about that, you know, and you have finally signed the paperwork, you've written the check and you are given the keys to your new car or whatever. So to confirm this business deal, the relative gives his sandal to Boaz, a symbol that says you are legally entitled to this land. This property, including Ruth, is yours. So he has renounced his right to both the land and to Ruth. You know, we wondered at the beginning, is this kind of a disgraceful, a shameful thing? Well, it doesn't look like it. Unlike Deuteronomy 25, when the brother's widow rips the sandal off of, his, of the redeemer kinsman, throws it in his face and says, may the name of your family be the one whose sandal has been pulled off. It was such a humiliation. But this seems to be okay. Boaz is going to step in. All will be well. So remember those 10 elders that Boaz invited to witness his business deal? He now turns to them and to the crowd that has gathered and says, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among the family or from his hometown. Today, you are my witnesses. Today, you are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. No backroom deal or secret negotiations here. This is an honest transaction. Boaz has bought, acquired, gotten, purchased property, land, and a vulnerable widow by the name of Ruth. Boaz is willing to step in where the legal guardian redeemer was not willing to do so, even though Boaz had no obligation to do it. He does it because he is a just man, a man of character, because he sees it's the right thing to do and so that the name of the dead might not be cut off from his family. He is following God's law. And because he is such an honorable man, the elders and people at the gate heap blessings upon him. They agree to the transaction saying, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Hmm. This might be a standard response kind of given by elders and the witnesses of a legal transaction, but wow, isn't it beautiful? They pronounce a blessing on Ruth that she would be as fertile as Rachel and Leah, who had 12 children between the two of them and their maids. They bless Boaz that he would have material wealth and a name in Bethlehem. Well, having lots of sons would definitely add to Boaz's prestige and prosperity. So they asked the Lord to give him even more children through Ruth, children that would be legally his, since the first son would be considered Malon's son, the grandson of Elimelech. Interesting that they also say, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. This is an interesting reference to a, using Chris's term, a salacious encounter between the great tribal leader Judah and his daughter-in-law, Tamar. You see, Tamar was married to Judah's firstborn son, Ur, but he was a wicked man and he died. 
So Judah told his other son, Onan, to kind of step up to the plate and raise up an, off, an offspring on Ur's behalf. But I won't go into detail, but Onan did not do his duty and he died because of it. So after losing two sons, Judah is kind of afraid to give in any more of his kids to Tamar and he sends her back to live with her father until his youngest son is old enough to marry. But guess what? Judah conveniently forgets about Tamar and does not fill, fulfill his legal obligation to her. So, kind of similar to Mr. So-and-so in the story of Ruth. So Tamar takes matters into her own hands and ends up bearing a son through Judah himself Read Genesis 38, and you'll get all the sordid details. That illegitimate child is named Perez. And as we will see next week, kind of a spoiler alert here, Perez is the great, 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 great grandfather of Boaz. And that's our text for today. You know? It's interesting because the writer of Ruth doesn't explain kind of why he or she thinks it's a story that's worth telling. Um, perhaps the author just simply wants the reader to consider, hmm, if a mere human being like Boaz, who had his own family baggage, remember his mother was Rahab, and then we have Perez in the family line, if he would choose to love a vulnerable outcast like Ruth, redeem her, bring her into his family, then might it be possible that God could love me and you and all the other outcasts of the world? Is it, would it be possible maybe that God would even want to protect them redeem them, and bring them into a fellowship with himself. That is what God does for us through Jesus Christ, the true Redeemer, Savior, and King. Do you believe that for yourself? I wonder too, have you experienced the stubborn, selfless, doesn't make sense, doesn't count the cost, love of God. Have you fully grasped how wide and high and long and deep is the love of Jesus Christ? Yes, okay, we will only be able to fully grasp and experience God's love when we are fully in his presence either when Jesus comes again or we are taken to be with him through death. However, my friend, my prayer is that each of us will come to appreciate and humbly receive that love of Jesus just a little more every day. Which reminds me, do you know the Jesus of the Bible? Would you like to know him more? Um, we'll be offering a class starting on October 16 here at Westminster on Wednesday morning called Knowing Christ. We'd love for you to join our leader, Mark Hammett, and others to find out more about who the Jesus of the Bible is. Also, too, if you are interested in learning practices, habits that can open us up to God's love and enable us to experience him more fully, I invite you to join us on Tuesday evenings for soul care here at Westminster from 6.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. Look for more information for both of these classes on our website or contact our church office. And lastly, friends, on kind of a more personal note, um, have you ever heard someone say the Bible is so against women? You know, maybe you even had that opinion yourself at some point in time. Well, it is true 
that the writings of the Old and New Testaments reflect the male-focused culture in which they are written. You know, we can't get around that fact. It's kind of like Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, you know, published in 1813. Well, it reflects the social mores of Regency England. However, when it comes to the Bible, for me, this historical reality behind this book is what it makes it all the more astounding that these past few weeks we've been studying the book of Ruth, not the book of Boaz. This is a story named after the lead female character, a story that was passed down orally for years and then finally put into writing generations later. It was a narrative that became part of the canon the books that were put together to create what we call the Holy Bible, the Word of God, our authority for life, our comfort in death. The books of Ruth and Esther, along with Joshua, Ezra, Nehemiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and others, reminds us that God works powerfully through both women and men to accomplish God's mission in the world, a mission to save the world through him. Considering also that in the days of the Old and New Testaments, women were viewed as property, as we see in Ruth, and their identity was ide tied to their father, the daughter of, to their husband, the wife of, or to their offspring, she was the mother of. It's all the more astounding to me that the biblical narrative not only includes stories about women, but they call these women by name. No Mrs. So-and-so here. Friends, in God's big picture plan, God wants to use women and men, the powerful and the vulnerable, the named and the anonymous, to accomplish his purposes, the salvation of the world. God cares about all of us, men and women, vulnerable and powerful, the named and the anonymous, and God deeply cares about you. Amen.
I'd like to thank Amy Bird, the author of Recovering from Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, and in particular for her insights in the chapter entitled, Why Not the Book of Boaz? This is an amazing book of the Bible. The fact that, yes, it is named for a woman and that a woman is a lead character in it. Yes, more importantly, it's a book of the Bible that puts on display God's chesed love. That God shows his love through people. God can show his love to you and through you and through me as well. That's what God desires for those of us who call themselves followers of Jesus, to show God's love to the world, to participate in God's mission of saving all people. So, friends, as you go about your day, uh, consider how you might be used by God to be a conduit of his love in the lives of others. Go in peace, and God bless you.